from um, the plague ship. We've from- got the yellow jack run up on the mast uh, <laughs> so that authorities in port know that we are carrying a noxious disease. And we're, co- we're anchored out in the middle of the lake, and we're not <laughs> going to shore anytime soon. Well, of course, since a plague is loose, it means that Colin definitely has it, was not able to make it to the boat today, yeah, so it's just no, me no. and Greg. Well, I mean, he was here. We we wrapped him in a sail. Uh, <laughs> we put a needle through his nose to make sure he was dead, and we uh, we sent him adrift overboard. Yeah. Waited, uh, waited with uh, rocks. Yeah, the bag did a little squirming on the way down, but that's just probably the currents. That's yeah, no, that's that's just <laughs> um air being released. Don't worry about it. So yeah, so uh, today, you know, it's not just actually going to be me and Greg. We did an interview with the wonderful and uh, a a certain a certain writer for a certain Seattle newspaper. Yeah, a certain writer for The Stranger that you guys have been wanting, and I know they've wanted to come on here for a long time, and uh, we're going to have that coming your way. We're going to be talking about coronavirus, economic collapse, uh, the nature of capitalism, and of course, uh, the unfolding Boeing disaster. Yeah, it's a wide-ranging uh, discussion, as you would guess. Um and it's a lot of fun, so uh, yeah, check it out. In your life, so Charles Mudede has long been an important cultural voice in my life. I I think I can best explain that by saying that uh, for a long time now, uh, Charles has had one of the most relentlessly unique voices in Seattle media. Um, today, there are a lot more options locally and otherwise for like say left economic voices um but that certainly hasn't always been the case and you know beyond that charles is also uh brings uh an african voice a seriously philosophical voice um and one that you know to this day and as long as i've been reading charles Mudede, you know you're gonna get a take you aren't reading anywhere else um so Thank you, Charles, for coming. Thank you for having me on. This, I hope this is exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're very excited to have you. Um, are you braving the uh, isolation? Oh, no. I, I knew that they were going to cancel um, all uh, restaurants and bar activities. I knew that was coming down the pipeline. And so I, uh, I went out to have one last drink. Uh, in a bar, knowing that it was it was going to be gone for at least a month or two, or indefinitely, I'm uh, I'm not a. Uh, uh, I mean, I understand that why these why these why these are, uh, you know, the, they're enforcing these kinds of restrictions, but it's still painful for anybody who's used to living publicly, you know. So yeah. Oh, in that way, I mean, I feel like Seattle is uh, maybe uniquely uh, posed for this quarantine, in that uh, most of the people don't like to go out or talk to anybody anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and that was it. It's like actually, I don't meet people at bars. How about how about that? I mean, what, what if I told you like I actually talk to no one? <laughs> I actually show up. I sit down by myself. For, I mean, and every. I mean, if anybody has known me as a as a bar person, and I go to lots of bars, they would say like, no, yeah, mostly it's about it's about finding. I I love you know when I was in Spain, I went to Spain and I I loved going to the bars in Spain because I just wanted people just to be around me. I didn't want to talk to them. And I didn't really, and so I'm very sad in that respect. You know what I mean? And, I, and so I go sit there and say, oh, yes, yeah, uh, Madrid is a beautiful city. You could just, <laughs> I just realized I didn't, even, like, I didn't hear a word, a person say a word. <laughs> like three weeks, I can't speak Spanish. But I thought it was really, like, engaging. <laughs> I always go out. <laughs> like, oh, I want to go into the city of Madrid. And I find, oh, that boy looks great. And I'd go in and I'd sit there by myself for several hours. And uh, and, I, and I'd leave thinking that oh that 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 was one of the better nights. I literally spoke to no one, and I do the same in Seattle. I just uh, wow. yeah, I just love yeah, I love the public life, the the, the ability that you can go out, and we, that's going to be uh, that's going away tomorrow for indefinitely, and I I support it, and so. 
you know, I'm I'm going yeah. to be, yeah, we, we, that's how that's how we're going to roll for a little bit. Yeah, and um, it's it's going to have this huge impact, right? Because like my local watering hole that's across the street from my house. It's already gone under for tax evasion, oh, yes. but other places, <laughs> other, other places <laughs> are going to have a real issue. Right, yeah. No. <laughs> we just did the normal kind of stuff. <laughs> We're just not making money at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, no, I, you know, it, yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's interesting because um, what I'm really disliking about all of this though, is I, you know, a part of me, you know, felt that, you know, I know restaurants and bars are luxury and so forth and so on. And I didn't want this kind of moralistic attitude to come out about it. Like, you know, this was bad to begin with and now so forth and so on. But my, and so I had that issue to deal with. And, you know, but I had another really bigger and deeper issue. And it's just like, we live in a society where we can like make these declarations about no more like restaurants, no more bars, no more flying here or whatever. And nobody actually offers a counter like, or something like to say like, why is it so easy to ban stuff like that than it is to say, um, no, um, we need to like have a moratorium on rents, right? Or we need to like yeah. we need to make sure that people have money during this time. Or you know, what I mean, these these other declarations seem to be harder to pull out. You know what I mean? It was like stunned, like, oh yeah, we're gonna have no bars. Oh, that's impressive. The most impressive thing I would hear today is any of the governors. Even, you know, in our liberal, like, Washington or liberal California or liberal New York City, coming out absolutely and saying, you know, for the next few weeks, your kids can't go to school, but we've decided we're going to make sure that uh, you, when you have to take care of them, you have this much amount of money. Like, not, not yeah. that sort of amount. Like everybody actually can make these declarations as if we live, and this is my, I was going to write this. They're making declarations as if we, as if we live in a socialist society. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. all these, no, right. I mean, all these things are set up. Oh yeah, okay. I dig it. I can't. I shouldn't go to work. I dig it. Cool. Okay. Um, I'll see you guys in two months. Goodbye. And uh, you know, here's a here's a tip. Or something. I mean, it's like, no. You. What are you guys talking about? Which. And I think that the right is sort of noticing this and taking advantage of it. And so we live in this sort of situation where these capitalistic structures are meant to actually undo. Like sensible decisions, such as or yeah. to question, or to you know, what I mean, or to to make um, to make like appear irrational decisions that are perfectly rational. That we should be doing this to save those we love and help. You know, and, you know. I mean, it's not simply that. I'm sorry. I want to do my last quick, quick thing. It's not simply, and a lot of people don't understand. It's not simply that the disease is not going to hit you. The problem is if you ended up making it if you're young and you ended up having an accident you're going to go to a stuffed hotel, uh, hospital you know what i mean it's just like you're yeah. not going to a hospital like every day like you're usually you know remember i had a little uh, uh, uh thing with uh, an allergy where where i was in an emergency like a year and a half ago where they had to drag me into the emergency room and pump drugs into me to reduce the swelling because I had an allergic reaction. And they did that, they did that pretty fast. They did it in a matter of like 30 minutes. And I'm like, that's not the hospital you're going on into today. If it's yeah. down with all of this stuff, uh, uh, all of these other people who really do, you know, who really need it. So it's not simply like saying, no, oh, goodbye, old people. It's like, no, it's more like, oh my God, that whole system is clogged. You know what I mean? And people don't understand the, the yeah. implications of that. And, yeah, so I think this, uh, you know, fits with uh, what we've got to talk about tonight. I think broadly this all uh, is encompassed by this disconnect between um, the sort of brutal reality of our society and economy mm -hmm. and this sort of myth that we're sho that is shoved down our throat daily under like neoliberalism by Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. And uh, we certainly get a lot of that here. And now this crisis is revealing, hopefully to a lot of people, just how fucking broken this whole system is. I mm -hmm. mean, this is very much in line with what mm -hmm. we talk about on this show. Um, Seattle sucks. I want to, I want to start 
um, by reading something that you wrote uh, in early 2018, just shortly before we began this podcast, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, as gentrification in this city was beginning to peak and erstwhile comfortable middle class white Seattle liberals were starting to feel or at least resent some of its effects. And you wrote a post for slog headlined for some Seattle does not just suck now. It has always sucked uh, in which you said you wrote uh, what the city's many white liberals miss might have been cool for them, but brutal for others. Seattle has never stopped sucking for black Americans. So that is something I think we try to keep in mind here when we talk about how much the city sucks. So, but before we get into mm. um, the collapsing economy and the Bo- and Boeing, which we've been following your analysis oh, yeah, on yeah. for over a year now, may, you know, help us like root us in uh the history of this like racist white supremacist city and broader economy that like now many uh white liberals are coming around to or having a problem with now that it's not stable but the even under the stability uh previous to trump or the coronavirus or whatever um there's a lot you know uh that was very brutal as you said yeah. for yeah the 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 least um, powerful people and in particular in Seattle, you know, that definitely meant uh, black Seattleites. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. When I first came to the city in the 1990s, the early 1990s, uh, there was a considerable um, black population in the center of the city. Um, It's interesting now because a lot of the views, I'm surprised at how close they were to the city because I I walked by the neighborhood recently and I and um, it's all it's all white now, but um, when I first mm-hmm. came in in back in the nineteen nineties, um, I said it was, it was really uh, depressing because there was no effort to invest in in those neighborhoods. I mean, the, the investments were very small. You know what I mean? There were there were there was there was nothing like the scale that you see now, and it's interesting to me because it's yeah. hard to explain to people. Um, how an economy actually works, and um, it's hard to say to like why do profits, where do profits come from? There's a there is this sort of like this sort of um, idea that profits are made by innovation and ingenuity. You know what I mean? Like people doing this incredible, yeah. right? Thinking about it and coming up, working in the in the in the um, in the in the garage, you know, um, and then or the carport, as the British would say, <laughs> coming up with the <laughs> with a with an invention and then selling it, and it's just like it's not exactly how it works at all. The entire mechanism is driven by the, the amount of investment, and if there's no investment, basically an invest a uh, neighborhood is just con- is just condemned, and the investment has to come from outside because no matter what population it is, usually um, there, there isn't enough capital accumulated to make any kind of significant presence as an as a as a as an as, a, as an investment right meaning and i mean i mean serious investment I'm not, I'm not talking like i'm not talking about what they did like in the 1990s when they said we're opening a, a starbucks on 23rd and and um and, and 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 jackson you know with with that's cool but you know whatever you know what i mean but that's not that's not what i'm talking mm-hmm. about when i mean investment i mean <laughs> with a you know, all caps <laughs> Right, investment, mm-hmm. and we and nobody, yeah, yeah. And nobody. But the, there's a there's a catch with this. It's hard to tell people. Yes, I know, and I love this idea because Magic Johnson will come down with me and say, "Yeah, we need massive investments in these new." But nobody actually thinks what oh, <laughs> about the danger of a system that's wholly dependent on the notion that the that the future is where profits are. This is a really difficult yeah. thing for people to sort of and grasp. Like, no, basically, we're driven by by the the the, the uh, direction or the, the the you know the pointing of of uh, of those who have the 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 the, the, the capacity to put money into a specific street or a specific neighborhood or whatever. And if you if they're not there, there's absolutely nothing. But there's another catch. If they are there, they have to keep being there. <laughs> because there's, like, yeah. there's just absolutely nothing left. No, we understand. Like, no, this is a, this is the catch twenty two kind of thing. Like, no, they absolutely investment can't stop. And a lot of white people don't 
kind of get this. Like, you know, you're trapped now because no matter what, you thought it was okay, you introduced investment, and you came into this neighborhood that was completely a blighted neighborhood or whatever, and now you are you're, you're, you got these grocery stores and so on and so on. And I said, like, no, but guess what? It doesn't stop there because this nature of our system is there has to be un, a constant injection of larger and larger investment to keep the prosperity uh, alive. If nobody understands, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's and so to me when I go back to this to this to this other, it's not simply like we needed investment. Even like no, this is a terrifying thing. Like I'm saying something even much more horrible and sad. Like I know we would have loved to have had investments in 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 this black Seattle and to have other things, but weirdly enough, that if that had actually gone through, we would have been trapped in this cycle of constantly becoming defensive because we know that if investment dries up, we're screwed. Well, there's also the problem of, you know, investment in neighborhoods like what you're talking about being uh, totally independent from and maybe even exploitive of the people who are already there, where the people who are already there have no equity in that. Yeah, um, is I mean, is there a version of that of, you know, I mean, we're talking about gentrification. Huh? Is there a, I mean, under this system, is there even a version of that where you could have equity for those people? Or is that just not even a possibility under this? system? Yeah, no, under to me, um, I always think that we should look at um, bees and and termites and see how they live for a model. And it seems to me that they don't seem to be paying debts to live in their lives. <laughs> or chained to 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 this idea that you have to have uh, equity increase in order to make up uh, to make ends meet where wages are falling or are not um, or um, inadequate. So I, I would say no, no, no. In all honesty, uh, uh, um, to me, uh, the thing that, that I don't, I don't the people sort of also don't accept, and this has been. A, big issue in uh in the whole narrative of development for me is that uh if you uh look at um a place like 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 the Esla Terrace um which was mm-hmm. 1941 or something like that came out of the sort of this FDR kind of um you know um socialist spirited moment they wouldn't call it socialist spirited they would call it something like you know public spirited or something like that to avoid the connotation with 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 this with this hideous word that uh we should work together to make each other better and so and so on but um if you look and see what happened at Yesla terrace um and and so and so on what that tells me is basically um um the model for housing Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do something really awful. I'm sorry to do this. I, I, I'm, everybody, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is the place for it. But the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it there and say like the big issue is that one is, uh, Yesla Terrace, meaning public housing. Uh, where did it come from? Let's go to Yesla Terrace. Here it is, right? Big deal. It kind of got wiped out. And um, right now, they're, they're sort of these mixed income developments that were sort of driven by mm-hmm. Paul Allen and so forth and so on. But if you look at what was going on in public housing, you say, what, wow, how did we land at public housing in the first place? Why was public housing even considered? And you could say, like, oh, it was World War, it was um, the, the crash of nineteen of 1929 and the, 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 the consequent, uh, the, 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 the depression that followed, and therefore the, 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 the government was in a state of panic and it needed to... To like deal some do something with 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 um with 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 all the, with with Hoovervilles and growing pop you know what I mean and this growing misery mm-hmm. and all this stuff you could say that but no actually public housing goes right even back to to sort of the Hausman uh Hausman um, um Paris it goes right back to the Third Empire you know what I mean uh, in in France it it, it goes it's prof- it's deep in our in our experience of capitalism. It's not a new thing. And the issue, even going back to then, going when you when you when you start with uh Hasmanization and then you go to the um the moment it say uh, the what you call the progressive moment uh in in uh, in, in uh, uh 
in in urban in urbanism um, in the nineteen uh, the late nineteenth century, and you go to something like the the beautiful city or city beautiful movement, uh, these are all like responses to the fact that capitalism can't supply housing. I mean, each one, yeah. is, you know, in one way or another, each one is is faced with this problem that it can't do it. Like, like and this was weird because you you would think that the, the Napoleon III. I mean, we're talking about the middle of the nineteenth century was aware of this fact when when the city was booming under these huge investments, these huge urban renewal de- developments. Even then, you know, you read Baudelaire and you read his poems, and so then you realize that what he's dealing with is the um, is a displacement of uh, of the of um, the Parisian poor, right, and the fact that no housing is offered uh, as a response to this displacement. And weirdly enough, um, we have not left that situation to this day. So you go from them, you go from Hausman, you go to to, uh, to, the, to the Chicago school in the 1920s, and you go to even to, until like the night, into the World War II, and you read somebody like Ruth, uh, Ruth Glass, was an urban sociologist who gave us the word gentrification. She was the one who introduced it when she realized that um, all the commitments that were made by the government to increase public housing and to develop um, um, urban uh, uh, um, um, urban ur- urban structures or urban spaces um, along um, um, along um, public lines rather than say. Uh, private uh, development lines. And she realized that after that commitment, which took off right after after millions of poor people threw their lives into the pit of wars, that they, you know, that they had this commitment right after World War II, um, it was already unraveling by the 1960s. And so... The, mm-hmm. the the housing crisis in England really begins in the 1960s uh, with a, a a slow undoing of public housing, and the issue is, and I'm sorry, my, I'm sorry, it was a long way to get around to this point, but I say, <laughs> like Seattle, no, no, please, you had to go back to um, something like Yesla Terrace, which was again came out of a moment of crisis, uh, mm-hmm. uh, right. Uh, and 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 uh, people forget there was there were slums, real hardcore slums in Seattle, and and that capitalism was unable to deal with them. And the only solution to these kinds of um, crises uh, was um, was was government built homes, which offered um, affordable 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 places for poor people, and so. You either have to make this decision, and there's no, and, and I mean, you can look at the history of housing in the United States. You have to make one of these two decisions. And I'm sorry, there's not, there's no other. I'm not, for me, somebody can tell me there's another way out of this. I, I, I'll be impressed to hear it. But there's only two things I've ever seen, and actually, it's kind of three. So I already lied to myself. I lied to everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if the Americans found it that third way. But there's, there's two. One is that you just leave it to the market, laissez-faire, right? fine and mm-hmm. but laissez faire um, um, housing policy will only lead you to um, uh, to a situation where uh, uh, only the rich can buy houses the, the middle class the middle mm-hmm. class disappears at that point and then you go back in yes. the 1930s and you see this before they implemented sort of a 30 year mortgage platform uh, by the government this there was, there was, there were like these five-year mortgages, and they, they were brutal, and you had to be renewed every five years. So you were basically sweating to pay for your house. There was the home ownership was almost like completely, you know, was well, not almost, but was completely a, a privilege. Then you, you, what happens is you had two choices in the USA. One was public housing, which meant that basically the house, uh, the government was saying. We're going to build long term. That's all it means. And a lot of people who are in capitalism yeah. don't quite understand this. Like, no, we're not saying we're going to build and lose money. Uh, we're just saying we're going to build uh, with the notion that it can be recovered after maybe fifty years, which is not impossible if you build a great place, right? You just say like, no, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it'll be fifty years. We're going to yeah. long round. It'll be you know, and we'll we'll recover the losses fifty years from now. 
the weird thing that people don't understand is that that may not even be capitalism. And that's the tough thing. Like you say like, no, no, no. You could actually have a market where you say like, yeah, it's 50 years out. It is nowhere on Wall Street you'll find anybody who'll even smoke that kind of crack. You know what I mean? Who'll even, yeah. who'll even, like, who'll even, like, who'll even like, what? I won't get paid. In what? Yeah, right. He's like, yeah, but you will make a profit in 50 years, right? You could actually say that. Yeah. In the long run, you could. Well, you can go, yeah, you can go to the market and no one's going to sell you that bet even. Like, I mean, that's just not um, a part of the futures market. Yes, right. Yeah. Because it's that's not even on their mind. Yes, because capitalism is not about long term. And this is something we both let go of. Capitalism is about the short term. It always has been. And and this is the thing we also misrecognize in the system we live in. And so public housing is not that it's losing money. It's just saying money could be is going to be made over a period of time that the market cannot absorb or operate. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to me that yeah. that's what I that is what I mean say public housing. I'm not saying giving out free housing. I'm just saying that no, actually the market cannot supply that kind of product it can't say i'm gonna make you a shoe that lasts you know 10 years <laughs> right you, you know what i mean like, yeah, it, yeah. It, can't, it can't provide you with stuff where the return the marginal utility of products is spread out over a long duration and yet you'd ask most people and you'd say if you really thought about it what's wrong with that What's wrong with yeah. recovering your money over a long period of time? I mean, well, that sounds perfectly rational. Um, but I think as we are seeing, I mean, it's not hard to see. And I think this is no new information. But what we're seeing now is, uh, or what maybe a lot of people will be turned on to in this and the last market crash is that capitalism is not rational for anybody but the people holding the capital and making the money. Um, I think. Uh, this, you know, takes us nicely into, um, the big thing we want to start talking about here. The economy is collapsing. The the market's been crashing for days. It's back up today, you know, um, a little bit. Um, and the apparent trigger that everyone's talking about is, you know, Mm COVID-19. Um, that seems to be the thing that's setting off this panic, uh, whether it's the, you know, impending sort of obvious slowdown by all the closures or the Trump administration's just particularly like oddball, unprepared response to it. But, you know, we invited you here because we want you to help us disabuse us of any notion that like this current or our future woes can be blamed solely on this virus or even on Trump. Um, and so, like I said, we've been talking about this, um, the Boeing catastrophe as it's unfolded over the last, uh, year plus. And so I want to go back to March 11th, uh, 2019, the day after the Ethiopian air, Ethiopian airlines crash. Uh, and you wrote in slog after, after dispatching with the like incredibly racist opening discourse around that crash, (laughs) um, uh, and citing all the gr- groundings of thirty-seven, th- uh, the 737 MAX around the world, you wrote, that said, let's turn to Boeing's recent stock buyback bonanza. <laughs> and later said, right. uh, I'm putting this out there because no other publication will. Two planes recently made by a corporation that over the past 20 years has increasingly focused on value extraction rather than value creation have in the sp- small space of five months crashed and killed over 300 people so yeah this is the this is basically the only place i you know read this connection this uh immediately one not having the instinct to you know dive down all the the technical rabbit hole of all this but to actually try to understand the broader uh economic story the broader business story that took us to this place so you know, remind us, help us understand the um, the buy, the stock buyback, uh, yeah, stuff, and and you know how we know about that and what that means for Boeing as a company in the last you know twenty years. Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm going to say something right now because I've been attacking um, Dominic Gates at the Seattle Times. And <laughs> We're going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the, and the, I, I, you know, my my biggest point is is that. Um, 
and about and all of, and all that was going on. And even in that article, it's not really that hard to to see. Um, it's not that hard to see uh, what 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 happened. It, it, it just takes a little effort to yeah. um, to sort it out. I mean, you know I mean I'm not, I'm not. Well, it takes a yeah. Go ahead. I think it takes a choice to have a perspective. Yes, right. Yeah. That is, yeah. It's a choice. It's a choice, and that's the point. I'm, I was sort of trying to, you know, when I go into it, and after that stuff, and I go right into it. Let's talk about the buybacks. And I've been talking about this actually since 2017 because I noticed that mm-hmm. uh, back then um, there was a uh, uh, all this talk about um, about the, the doing the layoffs. They, they, they were cutting jobs and so on, yeah. and, and this was at an alarming rate, at a, at a steady clip. And the only explanation that that was provided by the, the Seattle Times was that it was a matter of this neoliberal, what they call neoliberal metaphysics, which is the metaphysics of competition. And it is metaphysical. Yeah, it, there's nothing that grounds it in in anything in in reality. It's simply somebody believes it, and this is why there's a guy called Pierre uh, Shafra, and he he would he would talk about. He was an economist with the Cambridge School, Italian economist back in the, in the 1920s, and he would he would talk about this whole thing. He when he said he said these are metaphysical, he would say, and also Joan Robinson who who, who was as well that these things are basically metaphysical, meaning that it's something that someone believes. It's not something that is actually a reality, like the whole notion yeah. that. That we're cutting all these jobs because we have to remain competitive was completely nonsense. When you all you had to do, all you had to do was sit down and say, uh, "Well, if that's the case, how is it that their stock their stock value is rising so sharply?" And that was, yeah. that was it. Yeah. No, all you have to do is just ask. Like, is, is this supposed to be? If I was, I was born in a house where you know my father was an economist. And I and I and I was raised. And he would always show me things, um, and he would say, "Oh, that stock value is it going to rise tomorrow." My father was in the, in, the, in the Ministry of Industry and Technology, and so he would always like say to me, "Like, oh, this 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 stock value is going to shoot up tomorrow." And I was like, "Oh, why don't you make money off of it?" And he goes, "Oh, I can't. That's illegal." You know what I mean? And it's just like, but we live, we live <laughs> I mean, he actually, said, let me forget this. Like that was actually the way it actually supposed to work. A stock market was like, you couldn't just go and rig things. You couldn't go and just simply, you know what I mean? And to manipulate the value. You, you know, My father told me this, that that was, that was, that was you, you'd be thrown in jail if you'd done that. And I said, oh, okay. But he was, as a person who had the information. Now, if you think about that, what they were doing in terms of like the stock market over the past, uh, uh, so what happened was after uh, the crash of 2008, they were desperate for anything uh, to keep the game going on the stock market. And they came up with, um, what they do is they buy stock. This is not just Boeing. It was a bunch of people. There were two, there were two things mm-hmm. that they did over the past decade. And one was a buy stock to inflate value. One was they'd buy was acquisitions, acquisitions and buybacks. I want to just lay this out. So it's acquisitions and buybacks. Those were the two monsters that are going to be recognized in the future as being the uh, things that explode the the markets um, that that led to the to the to the crash that we're in right now. Buybacks. Well, and to the before the crash to the. Um, the celebrated stock market highs of the of the Trump years, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that ah. the, the greatest economy the world has ever seen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, the, 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 the Trump years. The Trump years. The, 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 okay. So you have. Yeah. Okay. My God, it's really weird because you always. I write these things in the stranger, and I write them. I write them. I write them in consequence of like, you, you know what I mean? Like a person who's mining. Like okay, I, I dealt with that. But I'm going to go. This is this other thing. I, I can go over here. There's several things that are mm-hmm. happening with 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 that with what you just mentioned. The Trump years. I, I my theory is that it had to do with with the lack of the with the absence of um what they call moral hazard, meaning that a lot of investors jumped in to the markets knowing that they were not going to be punished for for crazy yeah. gambling, and that was a big fuel, right? Uh, uh, well, if you weren't if you weren't going to be, be punished under an Obama administration, yes. 
uh, you're sure as hell not going to be Trump, under yeah, a right, Trump administration. Yeah, right, yeah. If the if Obama if the Obama Democrats are going to bail out yeah, yeah, right. any uh, the entire banking industry, Wall Street, you know, to the tune of billions of dollars, you can be sure that the Trump administration is going to do the same oh, thing. Oh, the Obama, Obama administration, you know, forgive me. I mean, I'm, I, I love my first black president, but my God, what he did with the with the with quantitative easing, what, what he permitted, that is, people have not examined that carefully enough. And so it was a backdoor no. where he produced a way, and Trump is using it right now, he produced a way by which you can transfer billions of public money to the markets without any um, involvement of the public itself the people who own the money yeah right and so when you what, what, what the what the fed balance sheet did and they call this quantitative eating i mean that what they what it allowed you to do was to say that you were greasing the machinery or so forth and so on and so on but you're actually absorbing uh you're actually propping up the markets without 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 public without public um for, you know what I mean? Without public knowledge, yeah. literally, without anybody yeah. knowing about it, and that was that was how that's how Obama reinflated the stock markets in the at the first part of the uh, the century. The only thing, the only difference with Obama, the only difference is in, in, in 2015 he realized he was doing this, and um, he attempted to to wind it down. So if you go and look at what he did with quantitative easing, he uh, he after piling all this debt on the public in the form of um, the, the Fed's books, what he did was he tried to get rid of it quietly, right, again. And he did. He got it down to about a trillion. And then Trump comes along and, it, and Trump is realizing that he has to maintain Trump for you. A bubble of uh, like everybody says, oh, you're here. You're going to be on our side. You're going to be on our team. Let's go. You know that. You know even that little hesitation by uh, Obama of saying, okay, I gotta, we gotta pay big some of this back. No, that's God. <laughs> completely yeah. gone under Trump. And so they know that. They absolutely know that. And so what happens is uh, Trump picks, realizes that he doesn't want to go to Congress to get money or to talk about like bailouts and shit like that. So he goes directly back to the Fed books. And it was Obama who came up with that. It was Obama. And everybody's going to notice, no, I know that quantitative easing goes all the way back to the Japanese and all this stuff. I get that. I get that. But it's Obama who implemented it in the USA as a way. Yeah, Obama and Bernanke came up with this this whole thing in addition to the rest to the yeah. bailouts that all of that stuff. Understand. Yes, right. The one that's in public. No, besides that, there was four trillion dollars right in the back door, <laughs> and nobody do nobody knew this. And so, right now, the money that they're talking about, even today, that the money that uh, that uh, Powell is talking about to inject with, it's not. Why is it coming? How is it? Congress hasn't been alerted about this, right? You know what I mean? Remember when, yeah. when Bush yeah. came out and Bush was like, you know, we need a trillion dollars in all the. You know, yeah, there's, there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the Congress became, you know, was like, what the hell? Are you, what are you talking about? We need all the, all this money, and uh, they had to plead for the, for the, for the, and even, even weirdly enough, the Democrats were the ones on, on, uh, on Bush's side in that, in that, in that moment. Actually, the Republicans didn't want to give him any money, and, uh, you know, and, and so we're in this weird situation where, right now. We have this Republican nutter in power, but he's not using um, tools that are um, out of thin air. These these tools, yeah. these tools have been developed on both the right and left. And I have to always tell people this. It's really hard because I love Jimmy Carter and I love all these people. I know they they you know they they they're, they're now building houses and so forth and so on. And, and you know what I mean, helping people. But if you go back. The development of neoliberalism and the development of the sort of monetarist approach to economics really begins with Jimmy Carter. And in earnest, it's not Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan didn't yeah. point Volcker. It was actually yeah. Jimmy Carter. And I did, Ronald Reagan actually could. Yeah. continued what what Carter started you know you know and that's that's a pattern right I mean yeah it was Paul Volcker who announced as, as you know a, in a democratic administration who said that the standard of 
the standard of living of the American working class would have to fall. Yes, and he was considered a Democrat. At. But he was in he was with the Reagan and he was with the Nixon administration. These things are deep, and so you hear this tool, the interest rate tool, the fact that the the, the notion of Fed independence. And all that sort of stuff. We today are in a situation where the Fed can pile debt indefinitely with no public in, with no public yeah. um, involvement. So this is a way that the Fed now. So as you're saying, they just announced yesterday like another one and a half trillion, yeah, yeah. in addition to the um, half a trillion probably since the fall. Um, that's gone in that you've written about. And this, of course, in addition to uh, all the money under the Obama administration, yes. but all the while and even before that. So that's the that's the Fed using quantitative easing, mm-hmm. propping up the stock market. But let's go back to these big blue chip companies, oh, in- Boeing, one of the exemplars yeah. of this yeah. phenomenon yeah. of using their own power by buying back their stocks yeah. to inflate yeah. their stock price and what that means beyond the inflation of the stock price. Okay, first of all, I wonder everybody should just read and I always say this. I'm not a I only all I do is I'm not an economist. I'm just a person who just reads the books. That's all. I, I just read the book. You know what I mean? <laughs> and if you read Mariana Mazzicato's um emper, uh, um impu, uh, what you call it, entrepreneurial state um back from 2013, mm-hmm. that is where I first learned about this this buyback business, and it was a way that uh, it's just a, to put it simply, it's a mechanism to um, distribute of uh, um, cash uh, that's that's inside of a company to uh, to shareholders to rich people. The big problem yeah. is that, and she pointed out, in an entrepreneurial state, the big problem was that. Um, um, People didn't understand that in the past, before this started happening, that um, there was this commitment to developing products and and so forth and so on. But what she found out was that, um, particularly, say something in say say the the, the 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 pharmaceutical companies, right, in the USA, they mm-hmm. were not making anything. They were not. They were they, they, that seventy percent of all innovations were coming actually from state funded. Um, um, uh, uh, um, research. And so uh, state-funded research uh, um, in the universities and, and also in the military, she does, well, we have to be honest about that, that, that was there and so on and so on. But, but, the, but, the, but the actual companies themselves weren't really doing anything new. The, and in fact, and if you looked at what they were doing in terms of like new, um, pro- if, if they had any money for products, it was always a product that was developed by another company or not, you know what I mean? And it, like, I, if somebody had made ibuprofen, you wouldn't. You, what you would do is you'd spend most of your research money developing something like ibuprofen, right? You know what I mean? As a counter that you could repatent you as could a re- new drug, like, yeah, yeah, with they, minimal investment. That's right, and that's what they were doing for the most part. So basically, no money was going into this notion. So, so we have this mythical idea of companies doing like. Mm-hmm fantastic things and coming up with new things. And no, actually, what Mariana Mazzicato was trying to point out was that actually it's universities, it's the public that has the innovation. And where this notion... Yeah. Where this notion that 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 that, that corporate, you know, that, that, that her 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 thing was like something like Silicon Valley is this, you know, melt, you know what I mean? This concentration of of great minds, innovation, yeah, right, right, yeah, and that sort of thing. And she's saying no, and since she would break down, like absolutely not. The entire iPhone, she pointed out, came out of. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all the components. She would break them down and say they all came from the state. And so, right, and and they're just doing the last, the last end, yeah. the last few yards yeah. of putting a bunch of these technologies yeah. that it, have had investment from the state together, um, or that they've bought from other people. Oh. Um, but yeah. th- this is a good. This takes us to Boeing, which you know, yeah, you can imagine in this other sort of uh, framework where you, and maybe this was true for a period in the 20th century yeah. in American yeah. capitalism, yeah. maybe where a company, a big industrial company would be concerned with uh, growing its product line, making the best product possible, yeah. Uh, yeah. continuing to be viable 
into the long future with new good products and and markets um and maintaining like a healthy company that was could be a going concern forever um but what we see is instead of but what that would involve right is reinvesting profits into the development of those new products and so you could have been boeing and you could have uh taken your profits um and invested heavily in the development of a new sort of medium range jet um but instead they took their profits and bought their own stock back off the market to inflate it for the sole profit purpose of enriching themselves the we're talking about the management class and um and the and the current stock owners and then they did what the pharmaceutical with their products they did what the pharmaceutical companies do they took a a current product and with minimal investment uh absolutely the bare minimum what we have seen now as this is sort of unraveled and we've learned uh about sort of the history of the 737 max uh program we've talked about a lot in here uh at every turn they basically because they were spending all their money on stock buybacks uh they put the absolute least into into the the 737 max and then it fell out of the sky yes yeah to the point where they apparently just to remodel that plane would have only cost seven billion dollars goodness gracious yeah this is the problem when i tell you well capitalism is not about time capitalism is all about the the moment it's not even you say like oh what a what a loss well, how terrible all they needed to do was just, was to remodel this plane to fit this new engine this was the issue was that they were dealing with right yeah and then they but that, that requ- would have required seven billion dollars to do that but that didn't yeah. matter but you'd say like oh oh this is an this is this is a mistake we can go and correct this and if they actually realize that it's more important that we spend you know time so and so and so on but i keep telling people like no you've made a mistake you actually don't know but you're not talking about capitalism at this point you're drifting away from capitalism and, yeah. and it's hard to say no no capitalism is really about and it's just terrible to say and i and i'm embarrassed to say this because i know um, it's like it's like it's like it's like in the Bible when you know the sons see their father dancing naked after drinking a little too much. And then you have to say this, you have to say this truth about the father, right? Because we've all been under capitalism. And, you know, we say what is the nakedness of capitalism, and it is simply um, that it does not have a time, anything like a time, you know, horizon. Like it doesn't really say. It doesn't really say that um, what, no, even worse than this, this is, this is our drunk father. Our drunk father's dancing. He's been drinking. We got to clothe him. But what has he been saying? What has he been saying all night that has embarrassed us and sort of like is shocking? He says, when I'm gone, um, or, or no, you know, it doesn't really matter what I do now because when I'm gone, I'm gone. Right. And so yeah. what, what it means is like they don't care because it doesn't matter so much like that guy, the CEO of uh, of uh, of the one who was just who was just dismissed. Finally, is it Muhlenberg? Yeah. That, right. It doesn't. He's gone. Yeah. I'm gone. You're gone. I'm go- You know, we're all gone. Well, he's good. He's fine. Yeah. He took what, like a sixty two million dollars, yeah. million dollar golden parachute amid all these layoffs, amid the crashes. Well, this is like the, the lie that I think we're confronting right now is this idea we and capitalism and neoliberalism tells us that these corporations are these, you know, they use the fact that they're this unit that is not of individuals that has its own um driving forces to sort of get away with a lot of things but the dirty truth at the end of it is that they aren't even that they're just really a tool of the ownership class the people who own the companies like uh to generate to get theirs and get the fuck out um i think like you know you're talking about like yeah seven billion to remodel the engine you know but that's that's at a point when i mean they'd already gone down the road right to them when the, by the time they started learning of the complications with this, they, that that was already passed. Like they'd already decided, we're just going to kick this thing out the door for as little money as possible. So when a problem like that comes up, yeah. oh yeah, you could. But 
the the seven billion dollar figure would make sense to a management team that wanted to build a good plane yeah. but to a management team that had already decided just get this fucking plane out the door for no money uh-huh. that was just it, the answer was always going to be find some bullshit solution and shut the fuck up mm-hmm. <laughs> and now the, all they're saying at the end of the day how do you make that how do you make that statement how do you say to people um um yeah uh, we're gonna lay off engineers and we're gonna lay off anybody who can even make this thing work um and so on and so on well how do you how do you do that i mean people don't ask how you say how do you make the decision like the safety of people and all this stuff and all these things and you say you know you make it because you know in your in your heart of heart you're protected from the consequences you know what I mean? mm-hmm. like you're, yeah. it's not a you you know that you can leave all of this, get your cash, and get out. And the people don't want to believe that it's is that brutal. It is that uh, uh, visceral, right? Uh, yeah. It is. There's no poetry to it. There's nothing nice. It's simply that they know they can get away with it. And because I'm gone, you know. Good luck. Bye bye. You know, what's his name? Yeah. He's going to be able to ride his bike around mountains and so forth and so on. He has $33 million in the bank. I mean, seriously, he hadn't. Right, because. He didn't need to worry he's about just, He's just a faceless person, rich person who can now just go be rich. And they know this for two, like, very key reasons. Right. Right. On the one hand, on the corporate, on the larger side, the corporate side, like, or the scale of the corporation, they know that even. If and this sort of we this remains to have totally played out. Our the, we're going to talk about this, but the whole you know stock market's crashing. Right. What's going to happen to Boeing is really in question. But we know that because and this is something we've talked about and you've talked about. This is Boeing is like a major like uh, linchpin of national defense industry. Yeah. There, so they know already they saw the banks got bailed out. They saw the yeah, auto industry got bailed out. It. You know, it. well, yeah. Boeing sitting there, they have no, there's no question in their mind that they're, that if shit really hits the fan, they can't fail. They cannot fail because they are a major contractor of the department of defense. Yes. And then the other half of it is that they also know that you cannot be prosecuted in America for financial crimes. If you couldn't do it under the hugely popular Democratic president yeah, yeah. Barack Obama, yeah. it's just not going to fucking happen. Yeah, but you know, there's something else here, which is a big question, and um, it's a big question for a lot of Americans to really. I mean, it's hard because I know that they're, 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 I know the average voter is swamped. And even us on the left have to really appreciate this, that they're swamped with nothing but bad information, oh, yeah. like constantly day in, day out. And, you know, it's hard to say this because a little bit of it sounds like we're being a little, um, uh, um, what do you call it, um, arrogant, right? Like we're standing above them. And so mm-hmm. so. But it, no, you are actually, because I am swamped with them. You are swamped with them. We all are swamped with information that says something like these that says, like, for example, uh, this is too big to fail, right? Like, Boeing is mm-hmm. too big to fail. Mm-hmm. But if you just look at the words closely enough, it means that these are, if if we are saying that, we are really also saying that these are industries that are nationalized. Like, you can't yeah. be... Can't yeah. be too. You can't be big to fail, and this is this is not. I'm not original in saying this. This is known. Like you can't say you're, you're you're big to fail and say that suddenly you're a private enterprise. That's a contradiction, right? <laughs> that's just like, that's like a, you know what I mean? at least at least it's worth well, to understand the rules, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And so at that point, when you say like, no, Boeing needs to be nationalized, everybody's like, well, that's no. Like, no, this is exactly the problem that we don't quite see. It's a nationalized, it's a national problem. It's no longer a matter of people sitting on boards and so forth and so on. This is an issue of the public and its investment and in all of the resources it's put into the engineers and so forth and so on. No, actually, this is now an issue of, of, uh, of national importance. If you're too big to fail, yeah. you are a company that is de facto, or we can say, you know what I mean? That is, that is, yeah. you, you've actually, well, I'll tell you. It's still these 
companies are still private in that the profit or at least the extraction of wealth from them uh, is still very much privatized. Yeah, it is. Well, but- well they're they're mistakes and uh their debt is ours right yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. There. yeah that's that's the structure you know that i'm the plane crashes no that's that's weirdly enough that's actually pretty new and other people don't kind of also when you look at the 19th century it wasn't always the case that that a company's failings was somehow um passed onto the public that's actually a, a, a second development in capitalism. I've always wanted to be able to be aware of that. That these things are, like, like what happens is suddenly the crashes and the and the it became so tremendous that no longer the market can support them, and the state had to be there to support the markets. Now, um, that's not even a, a fair picture of the thing because I could say something like the Bank of England in um in the in the in the in the seventeenth century, and I hate to say stuff like that, but I have to be honest that what happened was the you know the the, the Bank of England was created because uh uh those in those who were the aristocrats were in desperate need of cash, and and um and the and the Bank of England was created in a way to produce um um. Um, bonds, debts that could be sold, and that was the that was the innovation of the Bank of England. And, and I'm like, that's we come from a system where all of this is not irrelevant, and it's hard. It's so hard to say, well, like, no, this has been this is a pattern, and so on. So right now, right now, we're dealing with the quantitative easing. We're dealing with like um, the the tax cuts. We're dealing with all these things, and what we realize is we have a state devoted to like Boeing right now, knowing that it can get away with all of this waste and all of this robbery, I'm going to call it that, uh, because simply the state is there. And this, and it's like, no, go back to the earliest parts of capitalism. There's no real separation between the state. The question is between what the, the relationship between the state and the, and the market has been. In the 19th century, for the most part, enterprises could go under and so forth and so on. And there wasn't this notion of, of too too big to fail. That that sort of that's an emergence in the, in the 20th century. And so now you have these state entities, basically state entities. That's what they are. They're they're actually state departments that are operating as if they're like you know what I mean, as if they're owned. Like you, if you told them, yeah, J P Morgan is actually actually really a state bank that has somehow figured out a way to operate as if it is. A, uh, a, a, a a capitalist um, concern. Well, it's a state a state operation that they've figured out how to shovel money out the door to the owner to the stockholders. Stockholders and so much, but it's but what, what it's hard to say to people. This off again and again. It's like it's. I really beg people just to read. It's all there. I actually subscribe to the Wall Street. You know what I mean. And that's why I've been sort of tracking mm-hmm. this issue of like, um, you know, right now the Boeing's um, Boeing's uh, um, uh, uh, stock value is crashing, right? And again, yeah, you know, I receive a lot of hate mail when I point out that uh, something about Boeing. Um, uh, and I say like Boeing is going under. I would never, you know, this is this is this is drunk. Pretty much, they have actually spent all their money yeah. on all their money. Cash went to um, stock buybacks. They're bankrupt, and these planes. Yeah. They, they- well, tell us more about that. About exactly like how that happened, and what you know you learned about that. That and what that signals for other big blue chip companies yeah everybody's known that all the big chip blue companies were the next big ones like we had a housing we had a, a crash in 2008 that 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 issued from the housing market we're in a situation where my prediction is is that the uh the crash is going to receive its force from blue chip companies who resorted to all sorts of tricks to inflate their values, uh, um, or, or you know, one trick was, um, as I said, buybacks. Another one was acquisitions. You just bought other companies, and mm-hmm. their values would rise, and then you'd sell them off, and so on. So there's this 
uh, acquisitions bonanza and this buyback bonanza. Buybacks basically, as you said, uh, you go in and you reduce the number of stock, uh, uh, public stock, and then um, that would increase the value of, 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 of the yeah. of thing. But to me, that is called manipulation, and I don't know why anybody doesn't else call it yeah. manipulation because the stock market. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. And, and I say this I, I, with the yeah, yeah. with the most dumbest. You know what I mean? Like no, because um, a stock price is supposed to is supposed to represent the performance, the actual performance of the company. Well, I think the question is, is you know, during the Gilded Age, right, yeah. the railroad companies were doing the exact same thing, right? They were engaged in acquisitions of yeah, yeah. various lines yeah, and yeah. bits of track. And then they were then engaging and pumping up their own stock prices yeah, yeah. through, you know, various nefarious ways. Yeah. Except for at the time, we considered that criminal activity yeah, exactly. yeah. and bad. Yeah. And now... You know, and, and they would let those railroad companies fail too, which is interesting. But now capitalism has congealed to a point yeah. and is powerful enough, right? They, can, you know, these these companies like Boeing and stuff that they have enough government capture that they can basically just say, uh, "Yeah, we live in the gilded age," except for this time around. Uh, the you know government's printing you know press is going to be ours to keep the yes, party yes. going. But the weirdest thing about <laughs> yeah. you know you know what what I'm so sad often about is to make sense of this is takes so much time and so much reading that you know it would be lovely if we spent this time trying to figure out how photosynthesis works and you know what I mean like if we were dealing with like really, yeah, yeah. with really important <laughs> useful stuff, information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is to clear the fog around us. Which has been like, you know what I mean? Like to say, like actually, what they're doing is this, and Boeing is why is Boeing bankrupt? Why is a company that sold all these planes have no money, right, at all? And why were they laying off well, people during a period of of of, uh, of growth? Yeah. Well, and hence the shade thrown at the Seattle Times and Dominic Gates for not asking these questions all along that were very obvious they that if this was your beat, you should have been able to ask. No, and every, I received a lot of upset comment people oh yeah and i was like mm-hmm. it was not taken well no and i was like i'm sorry i'm gonna i'm going to just uh you know yeah i'm gonna say it as it is i, I went through i went through his entire archive how did this man write for like bloody the entire 10 years and not mention once that uh as if it didn't matter and i you know that the company was funneling a bunch of its cash the the, the bulk of it into not into into improving planes, not even into making workers happy, but into inflating its stock. What I mean, how in the world do you well, go through? And people, it's 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 yeah, it's a choice. It's a choice. And I'm just saying, if you, you said that it was your job, you being a journalist sitting there day in day out and eating your sandwiches later and so forth and so on, was the more important thing, then fine. I'm going to call you out on that, and I'm going to say you said nothing about a key development in Boeing's history that it spent to the tune of forty five billion dollars. For, I mean, I, I want people to understand this. This is not me. Yeah. I, I, I'm taking this from Wall Street. I'm not talking. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not talking about the. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about a, you know, the the monthly review, right? Some <laughs> pinko communist rag, right? I'm talking about a Wall Street Journal. I'm taking my. You know what I mean? I'm going to say this is what's known, and this is what they determined. If that is the scale of waste, I'll call it waste. Personally, my mind wants to say, but you have to always find it. Better. If that's the scale of corruption. Right, it, yeah. that that thing that you would actually move that, and then you sit you in a situation where you're borrowing money now. You're borrowing money because you have no money. You're borrowing to the tune of like nine million or whatever, and then you also are uh, you're, you're you're warning workers that oh shit things are going to be pretty bad. We might have to let you go pretty soon. And then finally, what they're doing, the last thing that they're doing right now is that the stock price has crashed. So basically, this week people did not notice this. Nobody reported it, and you know, in any kind of meaningful way. But the stock value of uh, Boeing was artificially maintained for the good part of a year after the crash, at around three hundred dollars a, a share. It peaked around four hundred about a year ago, exactly. But it was it hovered between four hundred and three hundred for until until this, con- until this particular moment. 
with the with the with the virus thing and so forth and so on. But now people Yeah, despite planes dropping out of the sky and their entire fleet grounded yes. around the world. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't. And but you know what? If anybody, I always tell people. Some people came to me and said, "Why is their stock value still high?" And I said, "You know what? There's a great movie <laughs> out there that you could watch. It's really actually it's, it's quite right about this. You know, and it's called The Big Short. And it's just it's just a very mm-hmm. simple. Go and watch that film, and you can see how people will artificially preserve the value of a stock price for as long as they can." If it's yeah, if it's in their interest, and the yeah. whole rest of the system, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. everyone else in the stock market wants the party to go on for as long as, as possible. possible. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you got a lot of pushback f- when you called out the Times and Dominic Gates, and I the the line that came back um, was that you know the Times and their reporting on it has been you know very thorough and ha- they've actually told a tough line and called Boeing out and they've they've revealed they've done yeah. all this very detailed reporting on the the various specific technical history of the problems with the 737 Max since the crashes they're like oh they've gone in they've really done the details and that is where <laughs> most of the reporting in most newspapers and that gets to most people yes, yes. is um is on the level of uh, the the technicalities, yeah, like right, yes. like this was a a, te- a um a glitch, a whoopsie, an engineering yeah, whoopsie, yeah, or a yeah. series of them. Okay. Um, that like, gosh, Absolutely. you know, stuff yeah. just goes yeah. wrong sometimes, yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is how, and there were bad calls, yeah. but it doesn't ask the question, like, what situation made this got them to that point where yeah. this, yeah like hundred year old company that builds these incredibly sophisticated yeah. flying machines that we trust got to this point where they made these dumbass mistakes and no one's asking yeah. that question in the right way. Yeah. Well, how, you know, and again, but nobody, when you ever, you go into the region of finance, everybody thinks you've left some kind of common sense, you know, realm. And now you're in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, okay. I'm going to say this real quickly, but, Okay, this is what I can say. But whenever I brought up back in the days that housing um, is is is, is um, in Seattle is not uh, entirely determined by supply and demand, but that that value can be captured and um, and greatly distorted. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's like yeah. that means that have no relationship to anything that you would consider to be ordinary. Um, day-to-day business right and it's like we it's people this is the thing that people have to to find and it's hard to say warn them and say no actually these are structural things these are structural things right now i'll let you know dominic dominic and everybody says and i was going to write about this this week and i'll just let you know i was going to write about this because dominic gate (laughs) wrote something that said oh um uh boeing hit by two black swans and if you go to it actually was on thursday and i was only too busy with the crisis of the stranger and we had you know what i mean what was going on but i didn't have time to sit down and to lay down like this is how it's done and it's like you have to like beat this again and again when he said black swan it was like where is he getting this idea to put out of nowhere out of nowhere just, yeah. yeah and that's what he's saying it's black unpredictable swan. thing that just like, happens but, yeah, something yeah yeah you got from right? nature you a got, comet right? coming out of the uh, sky you got it already right right but a lot of people don't know what that you know what i mean they think that's something that has to do with they don't know where black swan came from uh they may like I mean, there was no explanation of what he meant by black swan so it was like a mystification <laughs> aspect no go and read it i actually couldn't believe it i thought you're gonna break it down like no he doesn't explain that black swan came from talib right this guy was trying to say that mm-hmm. that basically the the, the the crash of 2008 was a consequence uh, not of a fragile market or one too packed with risks, right? That anything it didn't it could have could have even been a black fly. I mean, it could have crashed the whole thing down. Like you know what I mean? And so when you talk about the virus that we coronavirus, it's like they call, they're calling it a black swan, and it's just like no, the system was not could not um the system was the problem to begin with the way it's built the way it's structured the way that we you know what i mean the way that uh, uh it, it's 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 it lacks all forms of regulation this is the issue it's not that it 
something appeared that's a surprise. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, seriously, if you are completely, there's a scene that I love in uh, in North by Northwest, right? Uh, they put uh, Harry okay. Grant in the car <laughs> and they stuff him with booze, right? And then they uh-huh. take the brakes out of the car, <laughs> right? And they, yeah. they push the car downhill. And everybody's like saying like, he's trying to, you know, he's, he's fighting his drunkenness. He's looking through the air, right? And then suddenly he cry, you know, I mean, when the issue is like, you could say, oh, this is a, this is a tree problem. There's a tree at the side of the road, <laughs> right? If, if he had just cried, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you're talking yeah. about a tree and not about the fact that he was there was no brakes in the car. <laughs> the guy was like stuffed with booze, right? At all. And this is like where the black swan yeah. comes in. Like there's just no discussion about like the black swan. What? Are you kidding me? This is like yeah. And that's what the but Dominic Gates actually wrote that. And he said that the last two big events, one in the 737 and the other being right now with the virus, were black swans that are, right, that are suddenly uh, whacked Boeing. And yeah, was, Boeing was fine otherwise. And, and, and we, we accept this reporting. Well, I was going to say, I think, um, so I used to work for a company in Boeing supply chain, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, until uh, we got killed by this late Boeing shit. But anyways, but um, I used to remember having these conversations with management. We'd have, you know, we had 800 people, so we had like MBAs in our management. And, you know, they would tell us stuff like, hey, um, we're going to lay off like all the old machinists who know what they're doing and just hire 18-year-olds. Yeah. And you'd sit there and try and be yeah. like, well, you know, you can have them run $3 million machines. They're probably going to destroy them. That's going to be a problem. They would just stare blankly at you and be like, but that's not what's supposed to happen. And you'd sell, and you'd try and explain, like, but that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And they'd be like, but they should the, the machine shouldn't crash. Yeah. And there is this sort of like zombie like effect that business school, an environment of no consequences, et cetera, is put into these people's heads. Yeah. That we say, like, how did they not see this coming? Yeah. But the answer could just be that they're fucking stupid. Oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, or, no. Like, oh, yeah. no. No, no. I have to say this. You have to, I mean, I feel sorry for anybody. I mean, I do. I, I genuinely feel sorry because nobody understands the importance of ideas. People think that they're saying something that's coming out of their heads when really they're just parroting something that they've been that's been forced down their throat um and yeah. you know mm-hmm. it's really i really feel sorry for them i mean i do i mean you know it's not a uh, it's not you know one of the big things is that i mean we were they've been told again and again that somehow this is the realism right this is this is the game yeah. as it is and 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 and, and if you you, you, you have two choices. It's always weird. I always think that the democratic choice is to say, yeah, you're right. This is the good thing. But we may need to like think about this. This is like that Democrats operate, right? They, they, you know, they don't, yeah, they don't, the they don't, technical they don't, tweak. They don't, they don't, they don't, yeah, technical tweak. They don't, I mean, classic sort of like stuff with like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, dealing with like, oh, a market imperfection right you know what i mean like something like that and they said that and that's i get that like they're, they're, they're talking about. but the real thing is that oh shit you guys this whole thing is just doesn't work it doesn't make any sense at all well yeah i mean it's you know it's bad enough that yeah we've had this shoved down our throats that like this is the only possible system yeah that so much so that when these big things happen in the economy like in 2008 which you know they're still telling us was unpredictable yes um and that yeah uh and now with this they're saying oh well the economy was great but now with this virus that that's That's what's happening here yes right but but it's 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 worse than that yeah because that Uh, the the ideology is so pervasive that not only can you not ask those questions and yeah. get like a serious um, engagement. Yeah. But it, you're actually precluded from asking, and maybe an even more obvious question is why the fuck can't we have an economic system that can weather something like a global pandemic, something that has always happened and will always happen? Like, why don't, why, why do, how can we defend an economic system that 
just throws up its hands is like, yeah, well, fuck it. I mean, Black Swan, what were we going to do? Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, the Black Swan is like coming from out of space kind of thing. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. And uh, what is, you know, I, uh, I always used to say, you know, one thing I used to say about the dinosaurs is I actually do believe um, their tragedy is 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 less is less um, impressive than ours, right? I mean, the, the, okay. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you know, because they were just chewing leaves, and you know, one day this thing came out of the sky for real. You know, <laughs> no, I can forgive. I can forgive an economic system that can't deal with a like extinction level comet strike. Yeah, okay, yeah, like, yeah, I think that's like, we don't need to plan for that, but we. We should be able to have a system that can deal with a fucking disease that's right. spreading around that, that's the world. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying that. Uh, what is <laughs> oh, yeah. sad? I mean, the dinosaur, in all of its situation, mm-hmm. you know, stepping on this, you know what I mean? Trump, you know, w- w- you know enjoying bigness, and then one day it's all <laughs> over. Right, I mean, I mean, even that dinosaur. I mean, the dinosaur when it yells out, "What the fuck!" Right? What was that? That <laughs> the sky. I mean, it actually didn't even know it. Like it was just like, "What happened?" You know what I mean? And we, it, we actually do look into space. We can actually see distant objects coming. You know what I mean? Like this is the most embarrassing thing. Like you'd think that we, of all people, I mean, the tragedy is that it's not even a fucking comet. Like it's not even something that's like mm-hmm. you know what I mean? that we can even see that the dinosaur couldn't see. No, we're even worse. Right? We're even worse. We're here on Earth. And we're dealing with stuff that is sort of low-level crisis, right? That should be handled pretty easily by us, but we are in a situation where we are often tied uh, uh, culturally. This is very important. It's like, like, like what I mean is that the dinosaurs' tragedy is actually natural, whereas our tragedy is totally cultural. Meaning that when I say cultural, yeah. it means that these are things that we could actually that that, that are not out of our 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 ability to fix and correct. Everybody fears, it seems, taking a vacation, even that's what it is, a vacation from capitalism. Like, like we can't really imagine, like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so terrifying to people that we have to shut down. But the problem is, as I said to somebody else, the problem is we cannot just um, shut down uh, again um, without any kind of... Um, you know, without without understanding that a full shutdown from capitalism um, really means that. And that's what we have to go through. It means that mm-hmm. capitalism actually stops. We need to say uh, all debts, all, all whatever it is, has to stop. Like the whole machinery yeah. has to stop. And it's, it's like in the, everybody knows that as we go deeper and deeper into this, that 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 issue of like the machinery of capitalism can't just continue as we deal with a real crisis, right? And and so forth and so on. Um, and people are going to have to like make this like have to accept that capitalism is um, uh, capitalism. Um, you know what I mean? Capitalism just can, yeah. We 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 can, it's something that is not a a a. Uh, is not is not something that is has to be always be never not be you know what I mean and all these things, folks. It sucks. sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Well, yeah. What I think. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. say I think that uh, maybe like the adequate comparison too is right. Uh, Chomsky always had this line that the U.S. government was never scared that Cuba would fail. It was that it would succeed. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Example yeah, would yeah, be yeah. you know that, and I think. Like if we took a break from capitalism, the fear, right, is that what if we if we crack the illusion of capitalism's necessity? Yes, uh, I, people wouldn't want to go back. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not, I'm not yeah. even kidding you. This I'm telling you, I actually a back of my mind, I'm seeing signs of this fear, and you know what I mean. You could say like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. but I said no. You don't understand. You actually believe 
that capitalism is a completely objectified thing. It's a it operates on its own like like photosynthesis out there in the world. Mm-hmm. And nobody, but actually, it's completely dependent on a psychological or a social psychological state, like a, a sort of consensual hallucination, right? Like we all have to agree. Yeah. To, to to the system for it to work. And then suddenly what happens when lots of minds are disconnected from it and are doing other things rather than committing to its uh, the, the degeneration of its objective or its appearance of objectivity. You know what I mean? I, that to me, yeah. people don't appreciate it because they don't think that it exists outside of ourselves and the way that we interact with each other it's social character as 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 marx would put it well i'm i certainly hope that yeah this current you know covid19 crisis um sort of breaks some people of some illusions uh, makes it very clear maybe you know has the effect of getting some political will behind dismantling capitalism yeah but i think the last thing i want to talk about is that it may have to get it may we may be looking at things getting even worse than we're really broadly talking about at this point so like what we've been talking about over the last you know and what we've been reading in your articles and with um this about the essential weakness of our sort of corporate economy about how these corporations like boeing right uh so you know used all their profits to buy their own stock right. then well, s- took out true. loans to buy their own stock right, stripped right. their own value sold off yeah, all yeah, of yeah, their yeah. assets to buy their own stock uh even acquired other companies and the acquisition juices the stock yes. then sell off the companies and because they got a profit out of that yeah. juices the stock in a very perverse way where buying and selling the same thing has the same effect um of raising the stock right. so we've got all these companies Boeing here in this region that is, you know, collapsing for other reasons, laying all these people off. We've got all these other blue chip companies that are hollowed out, uh, massively in debt, have no assets, but have these massive pumped up um, stock prices. And now this now and maybe it's the and, you know, who, you know, the Boeing crisis itself could have maybe uh, tipped something. But we've had this quantitative easing. There's been other factors. The point is, as we've been reading, if you're following Charles and the Stranger, the, this economy is teetering on the brink. This is it's a fucking hall of mirrors. Yeah, um, yeah. So what what happens now? Like, what are we looking at when this starts um, revealing? Uh, because, you know, we're talking about this unprecedented shutdown. Yeah. And I think people are discussing it in terms of like, oh, my gosh. We're going to lose, you know, um, you know, Rick Santelli is on the fucking TV talking about, oh, this is going to drive uh, the markets down because we're going to lose several months of productivity and yeah, profits yeah, yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But but that is not really talking about the scale of what could happen, because if that is what's happened, that is what's going to happen. We are going to lose that productivity right. and people are going to lose their wages right. and that is going to bring the entire economy to halt. How does that not reveal the underlying sort of uh, like quicksand of this juiced up stock market? And then what the fuck happens at when that is shown to be the case? Yeah, you know, the best thing about our moment, there's actually a good side to it. It is. There's actually something that's interesting. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's something interesting that's happening right now. And you're, you're right. And that's a great summary. What do we do after we've like, uh, you know, we've had a situation where, you know, money was sent to shareholders and that came out of that whole school of shareholder maximization and stuff. People don't realize that in order to give shareholders money, somebody actually had to come up with an academic theory for it. This is the embarrassing thing about universities. But that's what it was called. Yeah, it's relatively new, too. It's relatively from new. The, nobody, you know, nobody... The went, 80s. Right, yeah. If you went back to the, to the 50s, people might have, might have laughed at you when you said that. Like, what? Yeah, right, the but, management used to tell the stockholders to go fuck themselves. Exactly. You know? There was a revolution. You know, I want to say something really quickly <laughs> before we go into something. I always tell people to watch the, uh, the interesting thing in Wall Street, the movie Wall Street. With Michael uh-huh. and Gecko. you know what he—he's actually—he is coming out, and it's a very—I was really fascinated by how, um, who's the director? Um, um, 
uh, Oliver Stone. Uh, Oliver Stone. I was really impressed with how accurate he was in 1984 uh, about the about the transition of economic power in corporate America. Gecko. Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah, Gecko is actually going after the managers. He's going after the mm-hmm. vice presidents. They're all smoking pipes and cigarettes, and they're really w- waiting to like have you know he's at a conference at a shareholder conference and he's mm-hmm. basically walking down and calling them doomed right he was walking the stage, and you have to see this whole scene and you know you can tell all they want to do is to leave and go play golf right this is you know they're not interested in like talking to shareholders this is bullshit yeah and he's telling him oh you guys are days are done that's what he's saying to them yeah this is over mm-hmm. and you know what i mean and they're like well, making pipes and i'm like that is such amazing in 84 that they saw the transitions meaning that we we're not so stupid we actually see these things and we know what's happening but yes well what's what's interesting i mean the greed is good speech that yeah. he makes there right. the kind of point is that is he has to introduce that idea to the stockholders yes this idea that yes they're they should be making as much money off this in dividends as yeah. possible that the that the performance of the stock should be the priority yeah. of management yes. and that if it is required that um stockholders uh activists stockholders like like him get in and use their power to control management to yeah. do that then right. so be it yeah. and the thing is he has he has to sell that to the crowd he's a salesman for this new yeah. ideology which means at the time this no one like this was crazy and because it is crazy because it is a fucking doom scenario for an economy that is just about juice like everything we've been talking about juicing yeah. up stock prices so the so this small class of uh owners can like cash out at the expense of fucking everything else which um but that's the, that's the thing is like that's a change he had to sell he had to get up there and, and like introduce this yeah. idea to them because it was foreign at it was the time foreign yeah and the people don't understand and this should be something that's empowering to the to the to the to the left is to know that these are not these are things people actually you know what i mean um um, um um, push. It's not. It's not that it comes out of yeah. the ground like it's you know like water, you know, in a spring or something. No, actually, someone has to put it into some people's heads, and then they look and like, oh, really? We can do it that way. And sure enough, yeah, you no, know, it's much easier. Well, it's easy enough to put. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's well, it's easy enough to push um like right wing yeah. capitalist ideologies yeah. to the people. Yeah who already have the money and the power and yeah. go like, Hey, yeah. if you do this, you could have more money and more power. Yeah. And when you're trying to, to sell ideology on the left, you're trying to sell it to a, a disparate class of working people who don't have the time or the power or right. money yes. to invest in that ideology. Yeah. It's a, it's a different fucking game. No, but and you're correct to call it like, but you know, I always said like, there's nothing wrong with the word ideology. It just means that which ideology is closer to reality and which one's further. And that, that, that's all you want to, you, that's the only sort of the question you have to ask. But to go back to uh, the, the situation in the, in the stock market and why I say mm-hmm. there is something like interesting and good that we should all take, that we should, if anything else we can learn from this moment. Um, um this is the um the way that uh the governors are responding to um to the to the to 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 the to the threat and trying to control it and um and 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 all of these other factors that are involved i mean when you look at it though you see uh in a microcosm or at least in, at a smaller scale i shall use that rather than the other one. You see at a smaller scale the way we should really be thinking about um, climate change. Like you're, 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 you're finally, mm-hmm. here you have like a situation where you could tell people like restaurants are closed when in the world of this larger development of, eco- of ecological catastrophe, you have to say no one drives. You know what I mean? For the first time, yeah. You, re- yeah. you realize that these statements can be made and these things can be stopped, right? And people 
can make adjustments. And, and you know, we haven't had a situation really um, that, that has, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they used to have their victory gardens back in World War II. You know what I mean? Where they told you to buy bonds mm-hmm. and all these kinds of mm-hmm. movements that were as like what we're doing right now. And almost, well, and rationing. Yes, and to me, the big danger is suddenly, for those on the right, is suddenly realizing that the state can make these kinds of strong decisions in the benefit of for the benefit of society. And I think this is a real deep rejection. It's another part of the rejection is knowing that suddenly you can say you're going to walk to work. You can say you're going yeah. to go in a public, you know, you're going to use a train. You can say no more plastic, right? You can say these things yeah. and you, and it can be massive. It can be as massive saying, you know, how much more massive is it than closing our bars? <laughs> you know, some of us. Nothing I can think of, <laughs> frankly. And I'm almost seeing this as a kind of, a, a, not a, a, what do you call it when you, when you, as a kind of, a, a, when you practice before something actually happens, maybe that's what it's called, as a kind of a run, <laughs> you know what I mean? A kind of like, yeah. here we uh, have, Rehearsal. Rehearsal, yeah. yes. We, we have this, re, we find, Let's block it out. Yes, we finally, we can yeah. actually say, and actually have a rehearsal to the coming larger, you know, with more diseases in itself than we can ever, nobody wants to imagine right now in terms of like what happens, but the coming climate catastrophe, which I think would, you know, bring to an end capitalism. Um, But um, here we are in this situation of getting used to a future that has to be not too far off. You know what I mean? Where we have to do these mm-hmm. things that are l- large yeah. scale social, right? You know what I mean? Organization, re- re- restructuring of habits and, and so forth and so on. And so to me, it's, I, to me, I'm almost like, thank you, um, little virus, because um, um, we need to be, we now need this practice more than any any time else. We now need to start have this in our imagination as possible. It was not there at all. And so to me, this is not entirely bad. That's what I'd say. Yeah, and I think that people are starting to see, like the realm of possibilities open up just a hair. I remember several weeks ago huh? when it, I guess, like hit the broader consciousness that in uh, that the Chinese government had built a hospital in Wuhan in like six days. Yes, right. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, people, right. yeah, and people, yeah, and people here are like, wait, I thought it takes twenty years to build a yeah, light rail yeah, yeah. five miles. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? yeah. No, yeah, no, but it and goes- I think it's. It, yeah, it's introducing the possibility of like the state can actually act, which is something that neoliberalism's tried to beat out of our heads, right? The state can never act yes. in good ways. So yes. I can act in bad ways all the time, but never in good yes, ways. Yes, but here's <laughs> where the DSA comes into me. This is where we have to come in. We have to do this not as a as a public, not as a uh, imposition. It has to be a, mm-hmm. it has to be done democratically, like meaning that we. This is the thing that because I know people will say like they'll come out and say oh, this is just like uh, fascism and so forth and so on. And you know what I mean? And then come out and say that. But no, Mm -hmm. these are democratically elected figures and uh, who are calling these shots and so forth and so on. And so, you know, we're going to say, no, it's not this. This is a this is a this is a, a public action as far as we can tell right now, for the most part. It's very public and and to encourage a deeper and deeper uh, 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 democratic, um, you know what I mean? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 presence in, in the in the crisis, and not just and you know we do, we don't we're not we're we really are thinking about the best uh, solution for all of us, and that's the that's the thing that I just that I think is is almost powerful or potentially powerful. Uh, uh, in this moment, is to say that no, yeah, no. So far, we see because some people say like, oh, the Chinese government's authoritarian; they can do this stuff and stuff and so on. And then you can tell them like, you know, the, you know. But I'm just like, well, you know, um, you know, we you could do the same things democratically. Yeah, democratically, exactly. Thank you. That's that's yeah. what I yeah. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. That mm-hmm. you can you can have the same results um, with with public with public. You know what I mean? 
involvement. Of yeah, what well, well, I think trying to convince people that like you, you know, the the reason why we look to the state or whatever is that you, in theory at least, can be, you know, interact with the state, be a part of the state, influence the state. The same can't be said for corporate America, right? So like yes. the issue is do we leave our public health? Do we leave our lives? Do we leave the fate of the planet up to these, you know, right. corporate institutions who don't have to listen to us at all? Or do we re-empower the state that at least in theory <laughs> we can act on and control? Yeah. You know, but, I, I would be skeptical of the of seeing the state like you know announce these closures and these limitations and these so quarantines really inspiring people uh, to think about government in a different more positive way you know maybe in its you know that it can make decisive action i i would i'm i'd have much more hope about um people seeing you know, if this gets really ugly in people's lives, um, right. seeing their corporate, um, you know, their bosses, the corporations they work for, the corporations they rely on services for, certainly the uh, healthcare corporations, the insurance corporations, just totally fail them and have to rely on, um, you know, government services in ways they haven't before in a very direct contact way, like like the National Guard uh, you know, hospital tents. Okay. You know, and think, Oh, actually, um, the job creators, uh, didn't save my fucking life. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. They, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The job creators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Um, so this is a, uh, I, I guess we're trying to find a little hope in this darkness. Here. Yeah. That's um, what I was trying to do. At least. <laughs> and that's good. And yeah, I mean, I, I like to be hopeful about this. I'm, you know, uh, I think hopefully, hopefully we can get through this, uh, catastrophe and something, good can come of it i think there's going to be a lot of pain though i think there's going to be a lot of you know there's going to be a lot of illness and death and then there's going to be a lot of economic pain and yeah. um you know uh it's not something anyone is looking forward to um if we can you know if a left movement can capitalize on it um to change some people's minds and and take some political will then so much the better but um i think we should you know, leave it on this semi hopeful yeah, yeah. note. Yeah. Um, Charles, thank you so much. All um, right. Long, long, uh, dream of ours and mine to get you on the show yeah. and have, um, exactly this conversation. Uh, this seemed like exactly the time. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, are we going to still be able to read you every few days on yeah, slot over the next like, period yeah i i'm so far you know if the, our world we live in a world where things change by the minute yes but yes. as I, I can say as of now yeah i've uh i've been preparing for my pieces for the next week so i'm still at the good I'm still at okay the danger, so i'll be there although we did as you know we went through a little uh a lot of, a little no a lot of we laid off 18 people and that really was yeah it's very sad it was incredibly yeah. um uh, it's brutal and i uh yeah, it's uh, hard to see yeah an institution reporters who are you know yeah, out there yeah you know uh yeah. telling stories in this city it's a it's a hard and sad thing and it's you know it's hap it's we're gonna just see more and more and more of this um but glad to know that we can at least um for the time being still um keep uh hearing what you have to say about all this on slog we'll probably post some links to some of the articles uh some of the posts that you know talk about the stuff we're talking about in this and maybe yeah. to our other big boeing episode um in when we post this it'll uh and um yeah again thank you so much uh yeah definitely. charles for coming all on. right you guys are great <laughs> keep up the good work and i'll thank you see so much you, uh i'll see you in this world Okay, wow. Uh that was um uh that was a, the fulfillment of a long dream of mine uh having Charles on the show. I really meant what I said about uh him being like a very long-term important uh voice for me um because I mean even the I mean we talked all about politics and economics and stuff, mm -hmm. but check out his 
his film reviews and recommendations yes. in The Stranger will turn you on to some shit that no one else will, or will have a take that no one else will. Yeah, his Brian. last one, yeah, his last one. I'd like to. I didn't. You know, we had a long interview. We talked about a lot of things, and I unfortunately did not get to the thing I wanted to talk about because Greg was over here just just vibrating like Amy Klobuchar's hair that Charles would even talk to him. And uh, I just wanted to salute his bravery for uh, defending the Wachowskis' absolute space masterpiece, Jupiter Ascending. Uh, this month, because that movie fucking rules. I just want to make clear, um, maybe, you know, I, I appreciate Charles for his genuinely unique takes. Don't always agree with them. Uh, um, Greg loves lawnmowers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like lawn. No, I hate lawnmowers as well. Um, it's Colin that loves lawnmowers, as we know from his lawn. But Jupiter Ascending is insane dog shit. <laughs> but um, uh, that seems like an attack directly at Channing Tatum, who's half man, half dog in it, and rides <laughs> flying rollerblades. Yeah, all cool. the I real mean, things. That there are the good movie. things about the movie. <laughs> okay, we should thank um, Ket 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 Ketera Ketera G. I don't know. We have a new the, patron. The they is, know what their name is. Yeah, the plague has not uh, made, a, made us any better at pronouncing anybody's name. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Also, um, this week's uh, special behind the paywall Patreon episode will be different. Um, it'll be the first installment of something new called the Mechanic. Mechanical Freak Presents. Ooh. Yeah, and in Mechanical Freak Presents, uh, we're going to be looking at a wider range of topics than we normally do. We're going to be going outside the Seattle bubble a little bit. This one still has some Seattle history, some Seattle stuff to it, so cool. it's, you're dipping your toe outside. Yeah, uh, we're letting people in on the shallow end right now. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah we're going to be doing some wider ranging topics. This one, uh, we talked to a... Resident um, historian. Resident historian and friend of the show, Marion Henderson. Uh, she's going to talk about the White Plague in uh, both history and in Seattle in the Progressive Era, which was uh, when the whole city was up in an uproar about a respiratory illness that was killing large numbers of people. So, you know... Not uh, doesn't apply to anything today. That's for sure. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks everybody. I hope you enjoyed that um, and uh, listened all the way to the very, very long end. Okay, <laughs> bye.